showing two tiny human figures lost in the Yosemite fog under the immensity of the heavens. We thought it was very sweet. Apparently the photographer believed that they were actually lost and he took his women photograph before helping them. So <laughs> they weren't that big. Well, here we go. Here is the sun, as I'm sure you recognise. The sun provides the energy for pretty much all life on Earth. We depend on it. It keeps us alive, but at some point in the future, it will stop being our beneficent mother and it will actually become our nemesis. We can understand the sun by studying it, and this is not how you will see the sun with an naked eye, this is how we see the sun through particular types of solar telescopes that can resolve the dazzle of it and actually start to show structure on it, and you can start to see what a violent place it actually is. Uh, you can see these huge explosions taking place on the surface, those bright areas. And you can see on the edge these enormous plumes of material erupting outwards. But the sun is just a star, and there are billions of stars in the universe. So we can learn about the future of our star by looking at other stars and looking at stars that are younger than ours or older than ours. So here is a beautiful star field taken by Hubble, and you can see in this one image, which is probably an area of the sky about the same as a grain of salt held at arm's length. But in that image, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. So over the whole sky, you can imagine there really are billions of them. But the other thing you can see is that they're different colours, right? There's a yellow one, which is similar colour to our star, the sun. But there are blue ones, there are sort of reddish, pinky ones. And the colour tells you about their temperature. Here is a very famous constellation. Even I can do this one. Anyone want to guess what it is? Orion. Very good. I'm very impressed. And you can see the giant red star in the shoulder there. That's Betelgeuse, made famous by Douglas Adams, um, the home of, say, called Beetlebrox et al. Uh, and the star down in the bottom right corner is Rigel. And Rigel, you can see, is very blue. Betelgeuse is very red because they're very different temperatures. Betelgeuse is quite cool, it's only about 3,500 degrees. Rigel is about 10,000 degrees. And as you all know, if you heat something up, first it kind of glows red hot, then yellow hot, and then kind of bluey white, and finally white hot. And so the, the color of the star tells you about the temperature. But we can learn a lot from looking at this, this constellation about how stars live and how they die. That is the Orion Nebula. So I'll just go back, actually. That's what it looks like to the naked eye. If you look below the, the belt of Orion, you'll see Orion, well, we like to call it his sword, when we give plans to shows to kids, <laughs> to our own imagination. In the middle of the sword, um, you can see what the place is like in our office at Greenwich, can't you? The middle star in the sword is not a star, and even with a naked eye, if it's a really dark night, you can see that it's slightly fuzzy. Um, and through a telescope with a long exposure photograph, it has this kind of pinkish glow to it. So if we go and zoom in with Hubble, this is what we see, it's this enormous cloud, it's called the Orion Nebula, it's a huge area, tens of light years across, of glowing gas and dust, and inside it, new stars are being born, and we know that because Hubble can see them, and these little kind of highlighted squares are actually stars which Hubble has identified, which are still forming. And you can see they're not like the sun, they're still surrounded by a lot of gunk, a lot of junk, and this is probably where their planets are forming. So the little kind of dots, in the, the bright glowing dots in the centre of those images are the new stars, the newborn stars. The gunk around them <coughs> is the dust and gas which hasn't been incorporated into the star, which is probably forming into new planets. So what we're seeing in Orion is the birth of new stars, and this is probably 
what our part of the universe looked like four and a half billion years ago when the sun was forming alongside a lot of other stars. So that's the actual birth of planets. But if we look at Betelgeuse, this is an artist's impression, but um, we know it's an enormous star, much bigger than the sun. If you put it in the middle of our solar system, it would swallow up the inner planets, including probably the Earth. And here is a little diagram you can see here. These are some stars of different sizes. Our sun down in the bottom, Sol, the little tiny one pixel dot. Betelgeuse is the big thing above it. Even that is not the biggest star though. And as you can see, if you put the Earth's orbit onto, superimpose it onto Betelgeuse, it would probably be orbiting just about around the surface of the star. So these are colossal objects, really, really big. And Betelgeuse is big enough that, and old enough, that it could go supernova at any time. Um, so Orion could look very different. It could blow up tomorrow, basically. And you would see it for several weeks as a star bright enough to see the day, and it would fade and disappear, and Orion would lack his, his shoulder. So by piecing together all of the information about different stars in the sky, we can piece together a life story for a star like the sun. And this is what it looks like. So you can see we start off in the top right hand corner with a star forming from a cloud of gas and dust. And once it's formed and the planets are formed around it, it settles down into a very comfortable, stable life. And it stays pretty much the same, getting gradually hotter, gradually brighter, for millions, billions of years. And you can see that all the way down the loop, the star pretty much the same size, pretty much the same colour. And it, a star like the Sun, we know from studying other stars, will stay like that for about 10 billion years. And our star, we know, is about four and a half billion years old, and that means it's about halfway through that stable period of its life. But it can't last forever, and we know this from physics and from studying the rest of the universe. Eventually it will run out of fuel in its core, and then it will swell up into what we call a red giant, and that's what you see in the last phase there, will become a huge star and it will expand until its surface is about the Earth's orbit. So this is what's going to happen. There's the sun as it is now, the little yellow dots down in the bottom of the screen. <coughs> That's the sun as it will be in five billion years time. As I say, the Earth's orbit is kind of there. So this is my future forecast, weather forecast if you like, for the Earth. <laughs> The sun is pretty stable, it's not going to change much over the next 5,000 million years, but it will gradually get hotter and brighter. Um, it's about 25% hotter and brighter now than it was when the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago. But interestingly, the temperature on the Earth has stayed pretty stable. And the reason for that is, you can see in the corner of this illustration, we have plants on the Earth. And as the sun has got brighter, Plants have become more efficient with photosynthesis, extracting energy from sunlight, and as part of that process they pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So as the sun's got brighter over billions of years, plants have taken carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere <coughs> to reduce the greenhouse effect. They haven't done it on purpose, it's just a happy side effect of their metabolism. And that's kept the temperature on the Earth stable. Of course what we're doing now is pushing things in the other direction. But even if we stop doing it tomorrow, in about half a billion years, the sun will be bright enough and hot enough that that process will stop being efficient and plants will stop being able to take enough carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to keep the temperature stable. And at that point, the Earth will go into a, a long but rather sad decline. The temperature will start to increase. Eventually, life on land will become impossible and the only possible life will be in the oceans. The oceans themselves will start to evaporate. As you probably know, water itself is quite a potent greenhouse gas. So as the oceans evaporate, the process accelerates. And in two or three billion years' time, the Earth will look like this. Most of the ocean is gone, the surface is quite barren, the sun is starting to get hotter and starting to swell in the sky. And eventually, even the atmosphere will boil away and the sun will be enormous. And eventually, this will be the view that you'll get from a barren, airless Earth. And this is the ultimate future that we have to look forward to. <laughs> quite some... Um, Quite impressive. There is a bit of a silver lining, though. <laughs> I thought you'd be pleased. As the sun expands, the Earth will become uninhabitable. But briefly, that habitable zone that we inhabit will move further out into the solar system. So it's possible that as the sun expands and gets hotter, Mars, 
<laughs> may become habitable. Perhaps its ice caps will melt, perhaps its surface will become flooded with water, perhaps enough gases will be released from the soil to give it habitable conditions. Jupiter's moon Europa, which is covered in frozen water, and we know, I think, it has liquid water under the surface, perhaps that will become a more Earth-like world. And even Saturn's moon Titan, which has an atmosphere of methane and nitrogen, perhaps as the sun expands and heat moves out from the solar system, perhaps that, briefly for a few million years, will become more Earth-like. But there's no escaping the fact that the sun eventually will die, and eventually, as it reaches the end, even of its rest giant phase, it will blow its outer layers gently away into space, but as it does that, it will sterilize the whole solar system. And this is a picture of a star which has done just that. What's left in the center is that little white dot. It's called the white dwarf star. That's the remaining core of the star. The outer layers of the star have now spread out for several light years to form this beautiful glowing shell. So the only consolation we have, the solar system completely sterilized, it will look really beautiful. <laughs> and here are some examples of other stars which are going through this process now. There again you can see the dead core of the star in the centre and the outer layers blasting outwards and forming these beautiful shell-like patterns. Really, really quite incredible. All the different colours in these images show you the different elements that have been cooked up inside the star during its lifetime. So the only hope really is that we find planets around other stars. Um, because what's going to be left around that, that white dwarf core of the sun is a solar system of dead, barren, sterile planets that will essentially persist until, who knows, the end of the universe. Dead worlds orbiting a dead star. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, though, because the universe will go on. And this is a beautiful view, again, from Astronomy Photographer of the Year. Look it up on the internet, lots of amazing pictures. Beautiful picture of the night sky. You can see something very prominent that you will never see in London because the light pollution is too bad. It's the Milky Way. If you've all seen the Milky Way, you've all been somewhere dark where you can see it. It's a pretty impressive sight. And that, of course, is our galaxy. It's the galaxy that we live in. And it looks like a band of light across the sky. Galileo was the first person to look at it with a telescope and realise it was made of thousands and thousands of individual stars. And this is a kind of a fisheye view showing the Milky Way stretching across the sky. And here we go, this is what Galileo sees when he looks through his telescope. Millions upon millions of stars. And here are some examples of other galaxies which really give us a clue as to what our galaxy would look like if we could fly outside of it. Here's a beautiful spiral. You can see millions of individual stars in this image. That's what makes up that milky combined glow. In the centre, the stars very tightly packed together, millions upon millions of them. If you lived on a planet around one of those stars, there would never be a night time. Even when your sun was below the horizon, the sky would be ablaze with other nearby stars. And right in the centre, a supermassive black hole, which we now know lives at the centre of all galaxies. And then you see the spiral arms, um, which are less dense, but they also have these bands, these clouds of dust in them, which is where these new stars are forming. We saw like the Orion Nebula. This is another spiral galaxy, but this one is tilted slightly towards us, so you can start to see that these things, although they're quite wide, they're actually quite thin, and this is one that we happen to see completely edge on. So if you don't look down and see all of the lovely spiral arms, we're just looking edge on, and you can see how thin it is, and now the lanes of dust in the spiral arms actually, they, they are very dense, and you can see they're blocking out the light from the centre of the galaxy. But when you look at that image, and compare it to the Milky Way, I think you can sort of get a, a picture of the galaxy that we live in. So that's sort of a top view, and that's a, a side view. And if this was our galaxy, that's where we'd be, as Douglas Adams put it, in one of the boring outer spiral arms in the suburban regions of our galaxy. <laughs> but perhaps that's not, it's not always bad to be in the suburbs, because being close to that black hole in the centre is, is not necessarily a fun place to be. So I think you can now see the Milky Way is also a spiral galaxy, because we're in the disk, we see it edge on, and that's why we get this band of light across the sky with those dark clouds of dust in it. So this is our galaxy. This is a, an artist's impression piecing together all the information we have about it. And um, this is where we are in the Orion Spur. And pretty much all the stars that you can see with the naked eye lie within that little bubble there. So it's with powerful telescopes that we're able to see deeper into our galaxy. Here is an example of another galaxy which is colliding with a neighbour, and you can see the smaller galaxy is being pulled in, and all sorts of fireworks are starting to go off as the gas clouds in the galaxies collide. Um, 
here's another example of two galaxies which are even more you know, um, advanced in their collision process. These galaxies are smashing together, um, combining under gravity, and um, here's another one. They've actually passed through each other and out the other side. Because the interesting thing about galaxies is although they contain billions upon billions of stars, the gaps between the stars are actually huge compared to the sizes of the stars themselves. So you can smash two galaxies together, none of the billions of stars in those galaxies will collide with each other. You can do the math statistically, it's incredibly unlikely that any of the stars will hit each other. But what does hit each other are the gas clouds. And you can see in the middle where the two galaxies have passed through each other, they've come out all twisted and distorted. But the gas clouds have collided, and in the middle they've collapsed to form a burst of new stars, a sort of a chain in the middle. And here's another example of two galaxies, which again, are sort of, they're, they're now sort of swinging back and forth like pendulums, smashing through each other and back, and gradually they're kind of merging together. We should have done this as interpretive dance, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so there they go. And here's a beautiful example of the process almost complete. You can see how the gas clouds, every time the galaxies fly through each other, the gas clouds stick together and crash together um, and are starting to, to condense to form new stars, which is what you've seen in all that kind of pinky blue light clustered in the dark dust. And here's a close-up of the same thing. You can see absolute chaos, fireworks, galactic fireworks going off all over the place. And this is what you end up with. The two galaxies eventually merge to form not a spiral galaxy, but a big, what we call an elliptical galaxy, a huge cluster of stars. And they're all orbiting in these sort of random orbits, like a swarm of bees all buzzing around each other. So that's what happens when galaxies collide. Back to Earth, here's our galaxy, the Milky Way. But can you see? off to the left, a little smudge of light. Does anybody know what that is? It's the furthest thing you can see with the naked eye. You won't see it from London, but anywhere dark. If you can see the Milky Way, you can see this. Andromeda? Andromeda. It's the Andromeda galaxy. It's our nearest large neighbouring galaxy. If we look at it with Hubble, that's what we see. So it's a really beautiful object. Um, and there it is. That's a little bit better than you'll see with the naked eye, but you can, it looks like a tiny smudge of light. And if you do manage to find it, um, it's pretty special because the photons of light hitting your retina have been travelling towards us for two and a half million years. So they're two and a half million years old. That picture taken by Hubble about three or four years ago actually shows Andromeda as it was two and a half million years ago. So it's a photograph of two and a half million BC. Uh, and that's the furthest thing you'll see with the naked eye. So you can actually get photons of that hitting your eye. It's real fossil light. But we know something about Andromeda, and this is quite recent stuff that just came out in the last few months. Um, we've known for some time that Andromeda and the Milky Way are moving vaguely towards each other, but in the last year or so, we've been able to pin those motions down. And we now know for sure that Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to collide with each other in four billion years. So just about the time that the sun is really going to get nasty anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we are in the Milky Way. Here's Andromeda. It's coming towards us. You can see in the distance the Triangulum Galaxy, which is a companion of Andromeda, we're still trying to work out exactly how that's going to get involved in the whole smash-up process. It may hit us first, it may come in and collide with the debris after the Milky Way and Andromeda have, have finished um, joining themselves together. But here is a long-term future prediction for the night sky. This is today, 2012, from somewhere dark. This is a NASA simulation, and you'll notice, watch the landscape at the bottom as well, because we're talking about billions of years. So this is geological timescales. This is in about two or three billion years' time. Quite impressive. You can see Andromeda looming large. But can you also see that the gravity of the two galaxies is already starting to distort their shapes? The Milky Way is starting to have a bit of a, a curve to it. You can see the mountains have eroded over billions of years. This is about three and a half, four billion years. Pretty impressive view. Andromeda now almost as impressive as our own galaxy. And then, look at that. That's what the night sky probably will look like in about five or six billion years. Incredible process. This is going to be really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> By now, the sun is going to be dead. Earth is going to be barren anyway. But see those enormously intense glowing clouds and clusters. This is where the, the gas clouds have smashed together. They're collapsing to form intense bursts of star formation. Lots of brand new stars forming and shining. Huge amounts of fierce radiation, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays being pumped out by these stars. This galaxy 
is not a nice place to live now. There's going to be very few stars with, with planets around them that are going to be hospitable for life. Eventually things start to calm, the two galaxies really start to merge together, and finally we're going to live or be dead in a, in a giant elliptical galaxy. So that's kind of what's going to happen. And instead of having this nice circular orbit around the Milky Way, we're now going to have a really weird orbit looping in and out of the central regions of the elliptical galaxy. So in seven or eight billion years' time, the night sky for every star in the Milky Way will look very, very different. And it's going to be a whole new phase for our galaxy, really, very different sky. So that is my long-term prediction. And that was my Twitter question. Thank you very much. Item is the planet moment of Zen. So, if you're not feeling calm enough after that, maybe we should calm down. Thank you very much. Thank you.